Welcome to Out With Dan, the podcast that spotlights and examines the voices of LGBTQ plus authors, characters, and our allies. Together, we lift our voices and we tell our stories. I'm Dan White. Join me as I chat with this week's author. Hello, and welcome back to Out With Dan. Today, I'm excited to talk to Joshua Moling about where the dead sleep. Welcome, Josh. Thanks, Dan. It's great to see you. Good to see you as well. It was nice to meet you in Nashville. Yeah, very brief interaction, but it's nice <laughs> to have even just 30 seconds makes it a little bit better, right? It makes it a lot easier for sure. Yeah. Will you give the audience an overview about uh, where the dead sleep? So where the dead sleep is the second book in the series that I'm, that I'm writing. Um, it's set in a small, um, fictional town in north central Minnesota and the main character's name is Ben Packard and he is a gay man living in rural Minnesota and working as a sheriff's deputy. So one, one of the things that always strikes me about anybody who sort of returns to their where they grew up is I think of Thomas Wolfe who wrote two books with such different titles Look Homeward Angel because I think that's everybody's idea of romanticizing the past. And then he also wrote the book, You Can Never Go Home Again. And I think that that always reminds me of when I read characters who have returned to where they grew up, because we return with eyes of the person that left, not necessarily the person we are now. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I think um, I think uh, in this book, Packard has unfinished business in this small town. And he's also looking for the, a reset. He's, he, uh, in the first book, he's only been there like two and a half, maybe three years. And he had kind of a tragedy in his personal life. And he was a cop in Minneapolis and um, just trying to, thinking he was gonna change his, his life by running away from his problems. And we realize that that doesn't work. And eventually he realizes that doesn't work. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting to go back to where you're from. Um, I grew up, <clears throat> I spent my summers in a really small town in South Dakota where my dad uh, was a beekeeper. And so every summer we would go to this small town and, um, you know, I just have great, glowing memories of summers in South Dakota. Um, and it's it's interesting to go back now with adult eyes and see it as it is today, as opposed to how I remember it from being a kid. Yeah. So one thing I want to compliment you on, um, I loved Ben Packard. I don't think anyone who reads your books, this series could not love Ben Packard. He is He's a very kind hearted person who's very smart. And of course, that's what I'm looking for when I read a detective series. I want someone who is smart and I want to be challenged. And you set up a lot of challenges. There's a lot of what I might call good and bad, uh, light and dark in this. Um, there is a there's two sort of sets of family. There's an original family, the Gerlachs, who are embedded in this community. And then there's the found family of Ben Packard. So talk a little bit about how you approach the found family and what that meant to you as an author. Yeah, so a big part of what Packard is going through, I mean, returning to this small town, is trying to kind of build a life for himself. And what does that look like? And who does he bring into that, you know, kind of close circle? Um, in the first book, he's really, he's kind of think, you know, he thinks he's going to flee to this small town and live like a monk. <laughs> and for you know the mistakes that he's made in the past and nobody's going to take an interest in him because he doesn't want anybody to take an interest in him and he realizes it in pretty short order that in a small town there's no such thing as anonymity <laughs> no there's not <laughs> he's got to learn the hard way sometimes he's a pretty <laughs> smart guy but it's some things he's kind of dumb about <laughs> I grew up in a village of about 400 or 450 people and you cannot hide. There is no such thing as hiding there. If you pick up one foot, the neighbor already knows what was under your shoe when you picked your foot up. I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. And of course, that that is something that features in Where the Dead Sleep. You did it so well in the fact that 
you give us a cast of characters who basically within within a parameter, most everybody knows everybody else. Mm -hmm. And they have things to talk about and they have things to share. Of course, it's their perception. Mm -hmm. You also give us something that I'll uh, we'll talk about a little bit, if you don't mind. You gave us a trio of sisters, the Gerlicks. And I will tell you that I knew some of those sisters growing up and in and in adult life as well. I mean, there is there is something about the people who have a lot of money and a lot of power and a lot of influence and the things they can do. And then the rest of us who are just everyday Joes. <laughs> so tell us about the Gerlicks. Yeah, so I think I mean, I don't know if this is universally true, but I think a lot of small towns, there's always the family with money. It's either the guy who owns the bank or the doctor or, you know, the big farmer who owns all the land or something. And that just kind of, you know, economically places you a level above most other people in the area. And um, yeah, with these, with these girls, like, so in the book, the father owns the bank at one time and they've got a lot of money and a lot of freedom and They've got a mother who is a complete narcissist and um, is always just raging war against one person or another. And she's really good at all the, their whole lives. These girls have been pitted against each other to stay in the mother's favor. And now as grown adults, they're still fighting in each other. And it was, I mean, they're kind of horrible people, but it was a lot of fun <laughs> to write these sisters who absolutely hate each other with every fiber of their being and just the horrible things that they would say to each other. And I, you know, I, it's a sad thing to say, but I really have known some people like that. I mean, I, I've, I've known family members to say things to each other that you wouldn't say in a boxing ring, you, <laughs> you know, but, but family managed to be able to do that. Yeah. Then I, want, I want to talk a little bit about the opposite side though. So with Stan and Marilyn Shaw, mm -hmm. especially with Marilyn, you gave her the voice. Oh, it's, mm, you gave her the voice that every gay person wishes they could hear. You gave her a voice of being able to say things to Ben that uplifted him so wonderfully. And it was so wonderful to read. It really was. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, ben, you know, again, Ben is finding out through these books that his he doesn't have as big of a secret as he thought he had. <laughs> he's, he's, he's got people quietly championing him. And he had people, you know, especially Stan, who kind of respected his boundaries about the things that he wanted to talk about and not talk about. And, um, you know, Stan knows more about Packard's past. We come to find out than Packard realized, you know, kind of by the end of the book. Um, yeah. And then, I mean, it's not a spoiler to say that this Stan dies early on in the book and that there's the big part of the book is Packard being pushed to run in this election to be sheriff. He's been acting sheriff and now a lot of people want him to run to be full-time job and he has absolutely no interest in this and Marilyn is there to you know she really does a good job encouraging him and you know trying to convince him that he actually could win this thing and he doesn't have as big of a um you know a check against him as he thinks he does being a gay man in a small town that's what she tries to convince him and you know, lets him know that he's got a lot of supporters that he probably doesn't, that he's not even really aware about. And I think so often, you know, it's not, I think in, I'm going to speak for Marilyn now. She's not only encouraging Ben, but she's also keeping the legacy of her husband who dies alive. Yeah. I mean, he, he had a trajectory of what he wanted to accomplish and how he saw this Sandy Lake area to look like. And I think Marilyn's job is not only to, you know, uplift Ben, but also say, let's protect Stan's legacy. Let's keep going where we're going. And that was, that was something that was very important because now there again, having grown up in a small area, I saw that as well. I mean, there's a, I often make fun of where I grew up because there was a lot of dysfunction, but there's a lot of dysfunction everywhere. But there was also a lot of support and love among 
certain people who really went out of their way to make sure they did good things. And that was a fun thing. It was something to explore that, you know, I'm from North Carolina, you're from Minnesota, and we have these same kind of conversations no matter where we are in life. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, Stan had a, a great legacy in this small town. He'd been elected sheriff over and over and over again. People really liked him. You know, he's the one who picked Packard to be the acting sheriff over other people who'd been there longer, had more experience, were locals. And so he kind of had a vision for who he wanted in that role, the kind of leader and the person with integrity that he wanted. And, um, yeah, Maryland, I think a lot, like you said, a lot of what Marilyn was trying to do was convince Packard that he was the right person to kind of continue on what, you know, carry on Stan's vision for that community. Yes. And so now we need to talk, you give, you give uh, Ben some romance, you know, uh, the drummer comes on the scene. And I, I yeah. it's so funny because there are some words you wrote uh, for Ben the next day where people are talking to him and they're interacting with him. And he, of course, thinks once again that he's hidden. He's run under the radar and everybody's there to tell him, you didn't run under the radar. Everyone <laughs> knows what you're doing, dude. <laughs> but I like that. And so there you give us hope, so to speak. You know, everybody doesn't have to have a partner, but we see in Ben that he's attractive and he meets people and, you know, and wonderful things happen. Yeah, I I always like to say every book I try to I give Packard a crime to solve and I try to get him laid. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was nice to see the uh, curtains billow, you know, the wind blowing into the curtain. So it's like, all right, I like that. And then, of course, it, later on in the book, he gets another interest that I assume in book number three, we'll get to flesh out a little more about that as well. Yeah, Ben's got a lot of options for live, being a gay man in a really small town, which is probably not quite uh, close to reality. But then the, the body count in this small town isn't very close to reality. <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, it's um, the number of people we run across in life. You know, you just have to keep your options open. Yeah. So I, I love that. So <laughs> now I will tell you, you did. There was something. um I don't remember which character enters a house with a gun and I was worried about Frank because I wasn't sure whether it was Ben's home they were in or not. So you passed the test, you you kept Frank alive. So tell the audience who Frank is. Frank is Packard's uh, three-legged rescue corgi that he gets in the first book. Uh, Frank is based on, my friend Rhonda had a corgi probably 20, 25 years ago and I'm not really much of a dog person in like, we don't have a dog. I don't really want a dog, but I sometimes, I like dog sitting more than I like dog ownership. And I was absolutely taken with Rhonda's dog, Frank. He's like my favorite dog in the world. And 25 years later, I'm still writing about Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, you know, the, who couldn't fall in love with Frank though? You know, you it, the description of him is so adorable, but you know, when he talks to the guy that he bought the dog from or got from the rescue, you know, he gave yeah. me a dog that didn't have all its parts and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was so cute. I mean, you know, I just fell in love with Frank and I'm like you, I love animals, but I don't want one because they're a responsibility and I don't think I'm responsible enough to have children or animals. So uh, <laughs> we're, at the, we're at my husband's, my husband's brother works in a restaurant and we were there last night talking to the bartender and she's got a parrot that she's had for 40 years. Oh my God. And I was like, she goes, do you guys want a bird? And I said, no, not a bird that lives forever. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I have a friend that's had one for almost 30 years now. I'm like, no, no. And it's a mean parrot as well. Hers is too. Yeah. Hers yeah is I, I'm like, why would you own anything that wants to bite everybody? I'm like, well, I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> so did you have a favorite character other than Ben that you wrote in this book? Um, I think one of my favorite characters in the series so far is Kelly. She's the admin in the sheriff's department and she does a good job keeping Ben in check. He, She's always kind of riding him a little bit. And um, there's a part, she's at a bear, she's the biggest Barry Manilow fan. 
and she's at a Barry Manilow concert at the beginning of the book when some key events happen. And Kelly is based on a coworker that I have who's also named Kelly, who in real life is also the world's biggest Barry Manilow fan. She's seen him in concert over 200 times. And so <laughs> I was, I told Kelly, I was like, I'm making this character a huge Barry Manilow fan in the second <laughs> book. And I was like, I hope you let me know now if you have a problem with it so I, I could change it. Um, <laughs> and she's gotten a huge kick out of it. And oh, um, that's, that's a cool. just saw Barry Manilow in concert like three or four weeks ago. He came to St. Paul and that was my second time. And that was probably enough for me. But that was probably Kelly's 200. 50th time i don't know oh wow you know, <laughs> it, it, i i have a friend that's that way about the dave matthews band so oh, like, yeah. okay you know i okay i see it but yeah after a while i'm like okay i'm ready for a break so, <laughs> so did you create the term fanalo or is that a real term out in the world like swifty is that's a real term okay yeah, there's fanalos this <laughs> real thing <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, I just, I, as I said, once again, Where the Dead Sleep is such a great book, Josh. I enjoyed it so very much. Thank um, you. Do you have a website or social media you'd like to share? Yeah. So my website is is just my name, joshuamoling.com. Um, I'm most active on Instagram, I would say. It's just at jmoling. Um, I'm on Facebook. You can. I'm easy to find on Facebook as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Dan. I had a great time. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Out with Dan. You can find more information about this podcast and its host at outwithdan.com, on Twitter at outwithdan, and on Instagram and Facebook at gooutwithdan. This podcast is hosted by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network, and the theme music is provided by bensound.com. Join us again soon for the next episode of Out With Dan.